Your name's Tanya. Go ahead. Cody. <laughs> Cody. And Cody, you've been with us for three uh, months. Six months. Yep, 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 yep. Mark? Yep, I just joined last month. Okay. So. Welcome. Thank you. Michaela, uh, I don't even know what six months. <laughs> okay. Um, Welcome back. Welcome back. Who are you? I know who am I? Yeah. Um, I'm Melody. I've been with Keller Williams for about three years. I was one year as admin and two years now as an agent. So. Yay. Yeah. Thanks for sitting in today. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We just joined like a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yes. Thank you. Awesome. Hi, Brian. Kayla and Gio. Yeah. Gio. Okay. okay. We were just doing, we're just introducing ourselves. Oh, okay. People, so I'm Kristen. Well, Laura, brand new, six weeks in. So. Yay. Right. Awesome. I got logged in. Okay. So um, last <laughs> week, we went through the purchase agreement, kind of at a thousand foot level. Um, today, we're going to create a create an opportunity command because we all need to know how to do that. If you don't know how to do it, then. This is your opportunity to learn. Pay attention because you need to be able to submit your documents and getting that opportunity to be part of that. Uh, and then whatever time we have left over, we'll start at the top of the purchase agreement. We'll really dig in, get to the depth of it, um, and hopefully get through page two or three, maybe through page three. If page. not, like we have time, we can do this another week and another week yeah, and yeah, another week. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, the longer it takes on the purchase agreement, <laughs> probably because you guys are asking great questions. And so it'll slow us down and it, those questions will be really useful for everybody involved. So, so again, it's not me just, hopefully it's not just me talking or just Tanya talking. Hopefully you're all participating as well. Yeah, please ask questions okay. on anything at all. So Tanya, let's start with creating the opportunity. Yep, hang on, I'm gonna share a screen and bring it over here. Did I do that right, Austin? Yep, it's over there. And you guys can see this, Brian. Say hi to Brian. Hi, Brian. Brian, can you hear me? We have a whole classroom here. Woo! I know, it's impressive. You're 60 people. <laughs> 60. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to teach on this? Yeah, it's your. your it, it's my thing. I mean, I can do it, but I come with her. All right, so I'm just gonna get up first because I'm gonna just talk. Yeah, you want to do that? Let's try. talk pages. Oh my gosh! Hey, because I like to talk with my arms and everything. Um, everybody, you don't have to use command if you don't want to for your general business. But if you want to get paid, we have to use command and we're going to teach you today what section you have to use to do that, right? So first and foremost, the first thing you have to do is actually create a contact to create an opportunity. All opportunities are transactions for you that have been in the business, you know, a transaction, right? That's your paperwork and the, the, the listing or the purchase agreement, right? We call it opportunities in here because we're going to start that opportunity from the minute we know that these people are going to buy or sell a home with you in the next 12 months, because this is an insight. Do you want to just go right over to opportunities real quick? Handshake. This is your insight into your, this is your pipeline, right? So from the minute we're cultivating them to buy or sell with us, and it also will show you, click on the Tanya one up at the top. Tanya, mm. right next to it, there you go. It'll show you like a rolling income of what you have. So this is your insight into rolling 12 months. What am I going to make? And how were my people at in my transactions? So first thing we do is create a contact. So go ahead and go over to, um, or you want to, do you, do you just create an opportunity? Uh, I just create an opportunity. I, do you? Okay. Well, I don't want them to learn that way. Okay. So you need a person in here, right? So we're going to create, we're going to create a contact. So add a contact up at the top. This is so fast, okay? You can wait if you want to until the moment you have a pending contract or a listing sign to add the contact contact in here. And um, you have to have an email address in here um, Does that in need order that? to send documents or, or send any kind of do uh, documentation. Okay, so that was where we go. We don't need to put it in there. Do we have to put it in to keep moving? No, we can switch over to my uh, test account that I use okay. if you want to. So you basically just come in, add in your information. Um, tagging is your lead source. If you really want to track your business, you're going to put a lead source in there. And then you're going to tag them as hopefully, you know, hot buyer, hot seller, 
or there's so many things. And if there isn't one you want, you can just start typing and then you can add it. What are some of the standard ones that you put in there? Just on the tags? Yeah, and the lead sources. You just put like, I just oh. put like Sphere. Yeah, Sphere, and that could be a tag as well. Okay. Um, buyer, okay. seller, past client, family, right? You can have whatever you want. I kind of like, let's make it simple. Let's go A clients, B clients, C clients. And then if they're a hot buyer, hot seller, I'm going to add that in as an additional tag. You can have as many tags as you want. But make sure that it makes sense to you and how you're utilizing it. So, and the tags would be great for tracking later. So, yeah, you see it's a your great way to, to grab everybody that's tagged a certain way to send them an email, to send them, put them on a newsletter, um, to do anything with them, mm -hmm. right? So, sphere, print. sphere's great. Sphere, is it your personal sphere? Is it a professional sphere? Is it, I mean, I, I think I get a little bit more specific than that for me. But. We can go deeper in this in our group coaching today if you guys want. That's a good idea. Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to cancel that right now. We're going to go to my fake account. So just search and type in Trista in the mm. contacts. C R Y. No, C -R -Y. Y. It's a Y, yeah. <laughs> there she is. Okay. So you're going to find your contact, but no, don't, don't check box it. Just click on the name. Click on the name to go in. Check boxes to do other tasks. Okay. Okay, so opportunities right up here. This is one way you could do it because most likely you're on the phone with the person while you're working on stuff, right? So you're going to add in your stuff. So we're going to create an opportunity up here at the top. And as you can see, you can have as many opportunities as possible on this person. So if they're buying a main home, if they're buying an investment property, if they're selling a property, you have three going at once if you want to. And those are all like, if you're, if you're working with somebody who wants to buy a house, then you would put an opportunity for them selling a house even if you haven't talked to them about it. Just because it's an opportunity. An offer if they own a home, you're gonna have a sell in a house. If they're buying a house, they're you're gonna put them in as a buyer. So when you come in, the opportunity type, this is important. If you don't choose the right one when you create the opportunity, let's say you accidentally have it as a listing, but they're actually a buyer, you're gonna to have to cancel it and go redo it because we can't switch it once it's created. The system doesn't allow that. So really pay attention to the opportunity type. Are they a buyer or are they a seller? If there's a co-buyer, you can add that person in right there. Just start typing the name, but they have to be a contact in your database already, which is why it's important to do your contacts first, right? And then the opportunity name. So it's a buyer and I'm doing this before. I know we're looking at buying houses. I don't have a property yet. I'm gonna leave the name as that. But once we know, the offer that we're writing on, we can change that. It has to be the address. <clears throat> the address has to be the opportunity to name once you have a pending contract, because it is the only way Vanessa can find the property to pay you. I don't want you not get paid, right? So um, this could result in like a couple of days delay. Like we had yeah. to track down, get a hold of you, find out what the name is. The banking cutoff already came. So you, you don't get your check till the next day and you say you need that check. So yeah. do it right the first and time. And it's a Friday, guess what? You're not getting paid till right. yeah. you're not getting paid till Tuesday now. Right. Yeah. Right? Because it takes after, a day. If it's after one o'clock in the afternoon, it's not getting processed that day. It's gonna get processed the next day and all direct deposits go in the next day. And this isn't the only file she's working on, right? So so do it right the first time. That way it streamlines you guys getting paid. So very important opportunity opportunity name will always be the address once you're pending, you know what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, then you're gonna come in. And so the important part about this is this goes into the tracking of your business, right? How long does it take to go pending? What's the average commission that you get? Like command is all this tracking in the backside. So that's- Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I just clicked that. outside, I'm gonna do it again. Buyer, opportunity name, one, two, three, Main Street, or whatever. Yeah, whatever you want. Go ahead. I have tons of those in here already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that house is super so, popular. Yeah, hot, hot buyer, actually. But so, do I, right. so I need to choose this right now? Yeah, so I closed it. So if I'm putting them in and we're writing an offer today, then I'm going to put maybe 45 days out. So I'm going to look. Today is the 10th. So I'm going to go over to December. And so the 25th? No, because that's a Saturday. <laughs> this is important, especially when you're writing offers. What about like, the 24th? That's a good day, right? No, nothing's going to be open. We can't record. Okay. 
So, and a lot of like, Clackamas County is not open on Friday or is it closes early? On closes Friday? early on Friday. So Fridays are not good days. I always do Wednesday. Wednesday is a fantastic day for closing. What happens if the lender doesn't get the docs over in time and we can't close? Now it rolls to Thursday. Nine times out of 10, your buyers are excited. They want to move in over the weekend, right? They might have movers already booked to move in over the weekend. Painters lined up to take care of the stuff. So make sure you give yourself a couple days. Can we just go back up to one accidents. thing real quick here? Um, this might be helpful for those of you who are going to have a team. So there is um, a spot here for owner. So if you're part of the team, you could put the owner of the opportunities name yeah. in here. And that's effective because um, it allows me to communicate with them as a principal broker on the backside and tag them if they have missing parts of their documents that they need for the file. So anyways. Yeah, so, and, and if you're, um, you saw when I told him to switch from the MCTTT or what, what do you, I don't even mm -hmm. know what to call it, yeah. our 575 team to my name, because I'm a rainmaker. So I have the team and I have my account. And then I think there was another one in there, but so as a team, you'll see it differently. But when you come in here, the team, that won't be grayed out. It'll actually be drop downable. Okay. All right. Commission and then opportunity. We're in an offer, so it's not cultivate. It's going to be active. And then over here, we're going to be negotiating because we're writing an offer, right? That's just going to put it into the proper stage for you. So then you don't have to go and drag it and drop it where you want it at and then go ahead and create. So then once it's created, now it's going to add it over here to, and it's going to go to the top. The most recent opportunity will always be at the top. So now we're going to go click into it. And I've noticed this every time when you're in incognito, it wants to translate up at the top. See that? Okay. So anytime you're in the general on a opportunity, this is what it looks like. If you need to edit the information, and this is really important in the general, can you go up to, there's a pencil. We can't see them on here. General information, there is a pencil right here. Oh, okay. There's a pencil, do you see it show up? Hmm. These dates I'll show right you here, you guys. It's right there. Yeah, it's, it's light gray on your screen, but for some reason you can't see it on here. These appointment dates, agreement one date, contract date, this is your conversion rates on the back end. So appointment schedule. That would be if I'm scheduling an appointment to meet with a buyer, I'm calling them, I'm talking to, to them today. I'm gonna put today's date in here and the date of the appointment is gonna be here. That's a conversion rate. And when you see the goals, which we're gonna work on next week, we're gonna, this is, plays into that. So you don't have to figure it yourself. Command's gonna do it for you. The contract date, where'd you go? There it is. Agreement one. So if we wrote an offer today and it got accepted tomorrow, that'll be tomorrow's date. The contract date will be tomorrow's date. This could also be your listing agreement one day, right? So if we have a listing and I got that listing signed today, and then this would be the pending date, okay? And then your close date. The close date, if it changes, you need to make sure that you come in and adjust it, and then we'll talk about moving it to close when it's closed too. Yeah, so you're going to put that stuff in. Yeah. Question, so I'm, I'm just trying to understand this. So this is where we're paperless, right? So this yeah. is where all our documents are going. To That's right. Yes. Okay. So you're going to create this opportunity. There, right? So you're able to submit the. So okay. you're able to submit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Our TC, we use a PC. Our transaction for yeah. you can have access to that. To upload Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So if you want to use the system that as your CRM, then you're going to you want it to track all of your business and know where you're at because five years down the road, someone go, where's your business coming from? I have no idea. You don't right? Idea. That's typical. If you enter these dates in, command is going to do it for you mm -hmm. and, and, and the lead sources and everything. Mm -hmm. It's going to track everything for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you can put in the finance type over here as well. So if they're conventional loan. Cash, whatever. Yeah. Okay, so you can save or cancel. Let's cancel. Close out. Okay, so then you're going to go up. The buyer profile, just really quick, just to let you know, this is if they've connected to you through your app or your website. If they've actually created an account, it's going to show up in here. And what that does is it actually allows you to move them through the buyer seller guide on the app or on the website. So you want to check and see if they're in there and they have that in the documents. So this is where you're going to be yes, submitting. Sir. This is where you submit the documents to me. Um, we're going to choose a, a, a type here. So it's going to be a residential purchase. 
and it's going to auto load a couple three little subheadings underneath this file. So consultation would be any document that you want to put in there that had related to meeting them or anything kind of pre offer. Okay, but once you start writing an offer for them, then I want everything to go into this under contract file, and it's really easy to do. You can have a file open. Uh, you, you can connect. No, no, this is fine. No? Okay. So you can connect to you can connect this to to DocuSign, but I don't see a lot of value in that. No. Just down just download the PDFs, drag and then drop them in the appropriate spot. So you obviously your purchase agreement is going to go here. There's if there's a seller's counter offer, it goes there. If there's going to be additional document like additional counter offers or additional documents, you're going to come over here on these three little dots and add a document. And then you're going to give a little brief description of it and then drag and drop again, or you can manually do it um, by clicking on this to browse. It's very simple. It's very intuitive. Mm -hmm. If there is a required thing next to it, then these are the documents that are most likely 99% of the time going to be required for the transaction. Also for you to get paid. Right. Is <laughs> it auto populate those or are they the same? Every They're the same based upon the type of transaction you chose right here. So it's going to vary a little bit between these. Um, uh, and so and you're going to drag and drop, put them in. Um, and then once you've put in the documents that you have. They're going to put them in once they're signed. Yeah, yeah obviously. I'm sorry. Okay. Once they've been signed. It's all for your signed documents. Only. Once they're signed or within three business days of your client signing them, they need to be input in here. So and the term, the term, of, what's that? Yeah. The term that the state gives us is. Um, I believe it is, they need to be there from the, either where they're um, accepted, rejected, or withdrawn. So all documents need to be submitted within, I have to review them within seven business days of them being accepted, rejected, or withdrawn. So in order for me to have the time to do that, you guys need to get them into me within three business days. Okay. All right. And what were you saying, Tanya? You have to start the transaction in order for No, no, no. Uh, you have to submit. So when you um, upload a document here, no matter where, if you used to have one that you're uploading that's been signed, just submit it to Kelly, mm -hmm. okay? Because you might not have another one for four days. Mm -hmm. Then you're out of compliance with right. that. If you just upload the document on my end, he doesn't get it. I don't. I don't get it. I just. I can see that there's been something opened, but I don't know that I need to review it. So when you push submit to MC, that's when. I know that it's time for me to review it. And so as the transaction goes along, you're gonna upload documents and you're gonna submit them to me and I'm gonna review them. Um, I will, um, if I reject them, you'll get an email that says they're rejected and there'll be a little note um, that is right in here, like kind of, it'll be, there'll be like a little indicator. It'll say a note about what I need or what is missing in the on the document. Um, or, and I think it's also in the email, it'll say what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, but if there's anything that is returned or required that hasn't been submitted prior to closing, then I, we won't we won't pay out on the file unless there's yeah. unless unless there's an exception of some sort. If there needs to be an exception, you just need to let me know. Right? Can you open show where the comments are? Yep. Yeah. So right here, you can add comments. So let's say you sent sellers property disclosures. Or you're on the listing side. You sent the disclosures over, but the agent's not sending them back to you. And you emailed three times mm -hmm. and they're still not sending it back to you or whatever document it is, mm -hmm. then you'd come in and you'd say, Hey, Kelly, at Kelly, because it'll get them. I sent this three times. I email chain. You can upload your email too, right? And they won't send it back. Mm -hmm. They or, don't know if and it's yeah. closing tomorrow, right? Or if you wrote an offer and didn't get accepted, you never got any signed paperwork back. This That's is where you'd submit a note. Just submit a note to me so I know what I'm looking at. That we don't have to ask you about it again, and then I have to go back in and do it, and you don't have to get bothered by it, you don't have to go back and do it. So if you, the more detail you add in the beginning, the easier it is in the end, okay? So um, if you get to closing and there's any of these required forms that have not been fulfilled, or if there's any return forms, then we won't pay you out until they're returned, unless there's an exception made. Uh, when you do close the file, we'll need a settlement statement, which will be the final FERPTA settlement statement or the final settlement statement and a copy of the qualified substitute statement, which is a FERPTA document that's prepared by escrow saying that they're the substitute for the, the that they've um, complied with FERPTA stuff. From your escrow officer you'll have to, you may have to ask for yeah. the for the qualified substitute statement, um, but usually they give it to you. Upload them here, again, submit them like you would otherwise, and then I will review them. And then what will end up showing up is over here, it'll say approved, 
and right yep right yep approved or returned here, right mm -hmm. So you want them both to say approved, mm -hmm. then you know you're getting paid. Yep. And I usually go in and I look specifically for the closed files on that day. So I kind of move them up because I know you all want to get paid. So I move them up to the front of my list so I can look at them, approve them, and then get you guys. Can you go back you to the under contract? So I'm going to show them something to mm -hmm. help them out. They're all brand new. You guys don't know what, what contracts do I need? What do I have to use? Right? Guess what? Here's your checklist. That's what I was saying. That's right? right? Come right in here. Sorry, guys. That's you're all right. no worries. Come right in here. <laughs> You need a purchase and sales agreement. You need the disclosed limited agency. Uh, the, the pamphlet's not on here. But the pamphlet need, is, is it down here? Uh, it's, it may be down below. It's not, it's required. not required anymore, so I don't require it. But so. you know, in order for them to sign that uh, the agency, there's they have to initial that they got the pamphlet, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, I need, the, the pamphlet is always first, number one, that goes to my clients. So they understand what our relationship is and have them sign the, and this is on both sides and have them sign the agency agreement. Then you got your purchase and sales agreement. If it is in an HOA or a uh, condo, well, the condo has it on there, but if it's an HOA or if it is um, in a planned community that has an HOA, then you're going to have the HOA agenda. Mm -hmm. Where's that at? It's in here. It's in there. Mm -hmm. uh, but anything, and so you just kind of go through this. And some of these, right, the inspection reports, those are going to come to you later. The lead based paint addendum, if, it, if it's built uh, yeah. before. And so, and some of this stuff is just there for you to store it. Like, I, yeah. I don't ever read the home inspection report unless you need me to. Um, so it's conditional. It's right? just it's just something you're going to keep there. It's just nice to have in the file. Think of this as your cloud storage for all of your transactions mm -hmm. and everything that you get. And if you go back over to the top, Kelly, right here, custom folders, add a custom folder. Throw in your images, your pictures of the property that's a listing. Mm -hmm. But I can't review those, just no, so you know they don't. see those. So welcome. anything that you just want to have tied to that, that listing mm -hmm. or that sale, throw them in there, right? If you want to save your email chain that you have with the agent on the other side, upload it over there in a custom folder, mm -hmm. miscellaneous information or whatever yep. you want to call it. Yep. Cool. This is your Dropbox, should we say, right? All the emails. Yeah, don't ever. Yeah, you have to keep all your emails. Yeah, for, yeah. It's all for so you should either create a, a, an email box um, in your email for that for yeah. that for that transaction or that client, or download them and save them on your computer. You, if you're gonna don't don't please don't save them in these one of these three spots. I mean, if there's one that's yeah. pertinent to the sale, yes, but don't upload them because I have to review them and yeah. I don't want to review all your emails Put them in here if unless they're that. unless they're if they're relevant great but I don't need to know about your communications about whether they want a three-bedroom or two-bedroom or what so or so what basically what I do in my uh, little organization right so in my gmail I'll create a folder buyers and sellers or listings right and then under subfolder I'll put in the person's name and then under that subfolder is going to be the address of that property so then all, because if you have a buyer and you end up writing three different offers, right? Yeah. You're going to have three different folders, one for each address. Because if anybody comes back and, and inquires from the state or anywhere else that there was an issue or problem on one of those transactions, it makes it a lot easier for you to write over and find them in that folder. Yeah, think about it this way. So if somebody calls me and has a question about one of the transactions, or another principal broker calls me because that you made that other broker mad or they're crazy, whatever it is, right? If I have, I, immediately, I just have to go in there and hope that all the documents are here. If all the documents are here, I can just pick up the phone, have that conversation or talk to you really quick and have that conversation. Um, but if I don't have the documents, then you've got to get them to me and it slows everything down. And usually time is of the essence. When, when I get involved, time is usually of the essence. So having these documents at my fingertips is good for you. And it saves you from having to be like, oh my God, I'm showing property right now. Uh, I'll just run home and upload them really quick. You don't have time for that. So try to do them as you go. They'll save you time and efficiency later. Yeah. Okay. Can All right. Back to the, the pamphlet and then agency disclosure. <coughs> the pamphlet's not uh, mandatory anymore. No, no you have to deliver it, but I don't need it. to see a copy. They don't have to initiate. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because the agency agreement has a spot in there. The agency that, agreement's always said that you, you don't. Every, we'll look, yeah, we'll get to it. The yeah. agency agreement has always said that that you have delivered, that the sellers reviewed it, but now there's actual spot on the agency 
the disclosed limited agency agreement were the initial saying that they saw it. Okay. So it's like another layer, you know, it's like, it's monotonous. It's like, I don't know. It's like, it's like I signed something that said I saw it, but now I'm also going to initial and sign something that said I saw it. So okay. typical oversight. Okay. Are we done? Well, should we go back to command real quick? Do you guys yeah. have any other questions about the opportunity section of it? Oh, wait, no, there is. Um, why don't you go back to opportunities up there? Let's go into one that's actually open. No, wait, hold on. Okay. Let's say we upload our documents. We have a transaction that's pending. How do we get into commissions? So offers and commissions. Command has this horrible thing here, which I do not like this, but we have to do it. We have to work through this to open up commissions to be able to submit our commission, okay? So we got to come in and you have to add a new offer and it doesn't matter. You can just leave it as that and go in or you can go and name it, whatever you want to name it and work your way through it, okay? So we have to do these steps here. So um, you're gonna put in the offer date and the close date. So just leave those there like mm -hmm. that. And then the address. See it has a red asterisk here? You have to have an address on this. Anything that's red in this offer thing that we have to do to open up commissions, just skip through and put in whatever is red, okay? Yeah, just check one. And then go click on parties. And then all you have to do is it automatically fills in your buyer's information. You have to put in the seller name. And then down here, you have to put in the agent name. So go ahead and write in something. And then the agent, the associate name. You can, that's good. Oh, I'm writing. Oh, I'm a dual agency. I'm letting you represent so me. Go to terms. Mm -hmm. I always start tallying on these when I'm doing it. Okay. So then we have to do. Uh, did they take that out? It used to be red. Oh, let's come over and let's just um, hit agent analysis. Does it let us do it? There you go. And then down here at the bottom. So you just do the just do the fees up there and then hit agent analysis at the bottom. Now, if you really wanted to use this and you have, let's say you have a listing and you have four offers on it, you can actually do each offer in here. Do write in your pros and cons for your seller on why what's good about this offer, what's bad about this offer. And then you could actually like once you save it, you can actually compare them and you can send it all in it. It'll come out in a spreadsheet and show everything that you have, offer against offer against offer. You can email it directly through the system. Can, I, can I just tell you exactly why you're never gonna do that? <laughs> <clears throat> because you don't know what terms on the agreement are relevant to this to the buyer. Right. You may not know what your seller or your buyer, What you may That's not know exactly what's that. really important to them. So please don't use this. You could do a summary and you could just say- I still hate it. Cash. I still hate it. No, you don't still want to do anything? It. Yeah. Yes. yes. So when we're opening a transaction, we put the contact in, we do the opportunity, and then we also do the offer. Yes, this is what we're doing this would be, here. Yeah. This is something that they put in here just for us to get to commissions. Okay. I don't like it, but we have to do it to open up the commission. We can do that in the beginning, or, yeah, do, or it we, just has to be done before. Right, this well, would be your offer's been accepted. You've uploaded the documents and get this thing going. Get this out of the way. Yeah. This is the yeah. commission part. Yeah. This gets it over to Vanessa. And it also works with, you know, uh, our, our business model. We need yeah. to know where we're at, right? Every month on what's, so what's happening. Things, right? Yep. So then just do the main things you have to do. Hit save. Can we save it? Yes. And now uh, we have to accept it. Do you want me to accept it? Yep. Yeah, we want to accept it. Now I can manage the commission on this transaction. So we had to do that in order to do this, okay? So now that I'm in here, now I can actually come in and I can verify the information on this transaction. So if anything's red, it's missing, it's not gonna let you submit this over to, by mail, thank you. You have to edit the information and add in the dates, okay? And then as you scroll down, this is where it comes in, it shows you what your splits are. This is only gonna show you what you still owe in company dollar and royalty. 
Um, if it, you could have like four of them pending that aren't closed yet, and you'll be like, well, I already have these and it's going to go. This only changes once it closes. Yeah. Okay. So and don't look at this and be like, oh my God, I'm like $2 from capping. Why does it say I have to pay all this for capping? Because it hasn't registered. Because they yet. haven't registered yeah. until they actually close. Yeah. But it gives you a good idea. ENO is automatic every single time. This KW Cares is only going to show up if you're automatically setting that up that you're doing that. Okay. And then, so then we're going to make sure that that's all correct. If you have a referral, you're going to go up to edit age of payment. And then you're going to come down and right down at the bottom right here. If you have a referral or uh, which would be like the obsolete leads, right? Or another agent, you're going to choose what it is. If you have an outside referral to another agent in a different office, you have that referral form. Guess what's going to happen? You need to know the tax ID. That's going to be on the referral form. Okay. If you don't have it, you need to contact them and get them because it has to get in here to get paid. If you don't get it, then can they just uh, rip you off? If you don't get it signed back? If you don't have the tax ID number, then they can just say, I didn't get a referral. No, this is you paying them for a referral. <coughs> oh. We can't pay them without a tax yeah. ID number. Yeah, you have to have it. You have that agreement. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and if you have the right. agreement, don't think that you are going to get off on some technicality because you have the tax ID number. Yeah. You need to get the tax ID number. You have to get it. Yeah, you have to reach out and get that. Okay, so go ahead and cancel. So once you have that, then it like does everything in there. Go ahead and cancel on that. And then over here on the, the right hand side, this shows you the commission check coming in, royalty that's got to be paid out, any other deductions, your ENO, your KW cares if you're paying that, KWP cares. Um, we do actually do that directly through here. If you guys choose to do that, it doesn't show up in here. They have given us a spot and we don't want you to have to write in the tax ID every single time, right? Um, and then this is what your check will be when you get paid. So you have to hit submit, don't do that. No. Nope. You have to hit submit in order for it to get over, to get approved and uh, for it to be able to go into our system cool. to get paid, okay? That's good, Stop. That We want that done, <clears throat> do that at the beginning. We all know commissions change, right? Sales prices can change after inspections and stuff. It's easy to get in and change it once you do it. Mm -hmm. So don't worry about it. We can still go in and change. But we want to know, gives us an idea as a business where we're sitting at, how many closings we've got coming yeah. up. It also gives, um, it gives two insights to Vanessa and Kelly on, we have closings coming. We want to make sure you guys get your documents. There's anything missing, right? And to make sure you guys get paid on time. And if there's any discrepancy in regards to any of the amounts, who do we contact? Vanessa. Yeah. Vanessa, right. But some of this stuff, again, it, it won't, it's not up to date to the moment because it's not, if you still owe on your cap or you still owe yeah. okay. on your thing, then it. And, and it will, once it, so this is the main one. Mm -hmm. And then it goes into the Winmore system, right? And the accounting system where it's actually showing what's been paid out. Yeah. So if you have three closings in the same day, um, when it goes through the accounting system that we have, it will stop. It'll run the one. We do one at a time. So it'll run the run and take whatever you have left owed. And then the next ones you're going to get your 100%. Okay. So two different systems mm -hmm. for now. I don't know when they're changing that. Yeah. They're working on it. They spent a lot of money on command this year. They keep trying to upgrade and upgrade and upgrade. I, I just look at, I just watched a video on another CRM and it was amazing. I don't know the command will ever be that amazing, you know, but they say the best CRM is the one you use. So if you Pretty use much. this one, use it. It's great. If you like another one, great. But these are the basics that you have to know how yeah. to do. I have a, another question. When we are uploading the documents, do they have to be fully executed or yes. inside the system can we assign those documents? Uh, it goes, it's connected through DocuSign inside here. DocuSign. Yeah. It can connect through DocuSign. Yeah. I don't think it's super valuable because it depends on where you're at. If you have a lot of listings, then maybe it's worth it because then you can directly <clears throat> because it'll directly upload. So, what's the best workflow for that? Just download the documents, and once they're fully yeah, because really, yeah, because realistically, you're going to get majority of your documents are going to come from an agent on the other side, fully signed, right? Whether it's they sign the, they send you the purchase, you send it to your seller, hey, you got that in. But on your buy side, you're getting the final one from that yeah. seller signed, sure. right? So every single one's hitting your yeah. email anyways. Does it, that's not directly connected to the command. Mm -hmm. So it's going to get uploaded from the computer. Yeah, I you think from can a go in and connect. 
You have to do it at the very beginning before you do anything now. Personally, I just go to zip forms and then I do e-signature through DocuSign on zip forms. Yeah. It's one step. We're, we need it your very first time. We've got to come in and we've got to do that start transaction to connect everything because DocuSign is free through command. Okay, so you have to do it that first time to make sure everything's connected. But then after that, make your life simple. Just go straight to zip forms to write your offers. Make sure your zip forms is connected to your DocuSign and it's the right one. Uh, you guys that are new, it will be the right one. But those that are not, it, it's got to get connected and so then we can figure out if it's in the right one or not. Yeah, I don't think it's, it, it from a system standpoint, I think you want to do something that's repeatable every time. And connecting and using it one way this time, another way the other time. I just don't, I don't, and it's not like you're saving so much time by connecting, by connecting command to DocuSign. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Plus I, I save everything. I save all, even though they're saved here, I save every document on my computer as well. So do I. Because I just, I don't want, like if I don't have Wi-Fi for some reason or whatever, if I need to pull up that document and look at it and I don't want to log on, it just seems like it's easier just to pull, open it in a file and see it. So. Yeah. I use Dropbox. Yeah. And Dropbox saves it on my computer and in the cloud. Yeah. So I pay for it. To me, it's worth it, but I'm used to that, right? So that's my system that I utilize to save everything. Command is also your cloud, right? So you don't have to pay for another cloud service. But if you're going to save stuff on your computer, you better have a big hard drive, especially if you have listings, because those pictures will hog that up real fast, right? Same thing if you're paying for a cloud service, it's going to take it. And even the documents, because you'll have agents send you documents that are 20 megabytes. It's like, come on, seriously, you can't run it through the system and make it smaller, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you're the one doing that, or your TC is. So make sure that yeah. you're saving everything and the it, right way. I'd appreciate it if you guys would up when you when you when you are uploading documents for review, that you're just you're not running, you're not submitting big long on, run on things like separate them out. They have to be separated out. They need to be separated out so I can find it because I, if I'm looking, if I have to go back and look for it, or if the if the real estate agency comes in and they want to look at the files, they don't want to see a big mess. It looks disorganized. So. And DocuSign uh, can separate your files for you. Yeah. Okay, and your PDFs. Question: uh, um, uh, Google zip forms, right? Yes. So is there like a generic templates that we can like that the, the company use so we can kind of like start applying the same templates on our listings or our purchase agreements or we have to create those templates ourselves um there are not um no there you have to create them yourself okay. within zip forms okay, let's switch now and document. yeah <laughs> and so it's up to you if you want to do the template or not um but I, I'm kind of both ways on it. So like mm -hmm. at, at the top here, right? So where you're putting in, like if this is your, if you're, you would only do a template on a buyer's listing probably here on, a, on this document if you had a buyer, right? Uh -huh. So you may want to preload your information at the top here. That would make sense. Um, but I don't like a bunch of preloaded stuff because I just feel like it can make mistakes. And also and every with time the, forms, the forms update, they don't update your, your templates. Your templates. So when like, or you have to do the mid-year form adjustment. The, all the ones that are people's templates are not adjusted. They, so, do, they do them every year too, right? But they do them every year, but they will do them mid-year too. Right. So, so then you have to go back and do it. So it, I, the only, yes, you can save some time by doing this. I don't know how much time it takes. But the, the best way to save time on doing your contact information and your, all your license number and everything is parties. So yeah. Yeah. go in and create yourself and save it as a contact and your buyer and your seller right so that now every time we have a new document that comes in we just add the party to that well it's in docusign or in zip form you add it to that transaction and now it's going to show up every single time right mm -hmm. yep okay so we did the thousand fifty on this let's get into it we're get into the really deep something so um i'll kind of go through the quick part of the top here because this is all pretty intuitive but you're going to name yourself here as a listing agent if there's if you're like part of a team then there's two spots to have like the buyer's agent and the, sell, the, the other buyer's agent. So like the Fox team, they can put Mark Fox here and then down here, they could put, you know, um, you know, Caitlin uh, McCarthy or something like that. Right. Um, you want to put our office address in full here. Um, your, the company license number goes here. Your license number goes here. You can find those in the RMLS if you don't have them saved. Phone number, I always put my cell phone number because I want to be the first person to call on the transaction. And then I always put the office number just 
don't know. I guess my if they need to contact shoes. Kelly. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of getting two shoes. So I put the office number in there just so they can, if there's a problem, they can get a hold of me. And obviously my email address. And then for the for the buyer, for the seller's agent, I do the same. So you're gonna check most cases, sorry. Most cases you're gonna check the box here for buyer exclusively, and that's who you're representing. So you're kind of naming who the parties are and they're being represented by who here. Um, but if you were representing both parties, you would check that box. And then this information below would be identical to up here if you check this box. If not, you're going to put the sell listing agent's information down here, just in the same format. Put their phone number. You can put the. I think you should put their office phone number in there too, um, just so that real estate agency sees that you know what it is. Email address. Um, oh, I said, don't be a lazy agent, right? Yeah. Yeah. Fill it out. I mean, it's really, it's, it's, you're, you're looking at it, right? You're, you're going to pull up a window in RMLS. It's going to show you what their phone, the, the listing agent's phone number is. And then right below, it's going to have the listing agent's office number. Just put it in. It looks complete. Yeah. Okay. So if buyer and seller's agent and or, this is in bold, so it's important. If buyer and or seller's agent or firm are co-selling or co-listing this transaction, all agents and firms' names should be disclosed above. So that's really important. If both parties are represented by one or more agents in the same real estate firm, and agents are supervised by the same principal broker, me, and that real estate firm, buyer and seller acknowledge that said principal broker becomes the disclosed limited agent for both buyer and seller. So let's say you're writing an offer, like Cody, you're writing an offer on Mark's listing. So you'll be here, Mark will be here, you guys will represent your parties independently. But if you call me, I represent. I represent both, both parties together. Okay. So puts me in a little tight spot. So please disclose if you call with a question. <clears throat> um, let's go down a little bit further here. So buyer shall sign this acknowledgement at the time of signing this agreement before submission to the seller. <clears throat> Show shall sign this acknowledgement at the time this agreement is first submitted to seller. Even if this agreement will be rejected or a counteroffer will be made, seller's signature to this final agency acknowledgement shall not constitute acceptance of the agreement. So Basically, when you're the, the client, the principal's here, the buyer and the seller, they're going to sign agreeing that this up here is the case, that this is all accurate and true. Okay. And even um, like if, I, if I'm a listing agent and I've got a bunch of offers, I'm going to, re, I'm going to uh, reject some of them. I still want my, my seller to sign here and they'll have them sign the last page rejecting it, but I don't necessarily go through all the other parts. But I would definitely want them to sign here, just acknowledging who's who. Okay. So this is where it all starts, right? So this is where, like, this is how, this is what I talk about, like how it works, why it works. This is how, this is why, because we're getting a lot of description here. So this agreement is intended to be a legal and binding contract. If it is not understood, seek competent legal advice before signing for an explanation of the printed terms and provisions of this form regarding timing, notice, binding effect, et cetera. Seller and buyer encouraged to closely review the definitions, instructions, sections below. So um, if, because we're in zip forms, if it's a spot you can't you can't write in, it's because it's auto populated. So um, yeah, so these will automatically get filled, and oops, and these mm -hmm. are the ones that you can mm -hmm. write in. All right, so we need to know the county the property is located for obvious reasons. Uh, the next line down here is where the the property address is going to go, and then below that we have to fill it in, no. and below that you have several options. So. The first one right here, I always put the tax ID number or tax ID numbers. If it's like a rural property and we're buying multiple tax lots, it could be tied to the same address. Um, I'm going to put the tax ID numbers here. You can also do the legal description if you wanted to right here. I don't think it's necessary. If you have the tax ID numbers, I think you firmly identify the property. Purchase price goes on line A. Earnest money amount goes in here. Earnest money is going to be probably one to two percent of the purchase price. This next line is that there's an additional earnest money amount. So this is rarely used, but um, I like it for this situation here. So let's say um, let's say your clients uh, will, uh, they're, they're putting five thousand dollars earnest money down, but for some reason it seemed like a good idea to give another five thousand dollars, like after you uh, cleared the inspection contingency or let's say after an acceptable appraisal, whatever it is, if there's an additional earnest money amount that's gonna be added, that's where it would go. And then we'll recognize that term later in the contract. Um, people never use this. I think it's kind of cool. I think it could like, it'd be a good way to kind of minimize your client's upfront exposure if you're working with a buyer and then make the seller feel better down the road. And 
because in Oregon, and not, not just Oregon, because if we're using this purchase agreement, um, any any um, discrepancy, any argument over earnest money um, is going to go to small claims court if it's less than $10,000 and then arbitration if more. So if it goes into small claims court, there aren't a lot of repercussions from one of the parties not agreeing to release it, except for going to small claims court. So let's say it's a, it's a, you know, a, a million dollar property, whatever you want to do, twenty thousand dollars earnest money. Doing ten first, and another ten might be good um, because then you have the ability to go to small claims court and settle it a little easier. And then once you get further in the transaction, adding another ten thousand dollars, where people are a little bit more vested, and you have to go to arbitration for it. That's mm -hmm. how they use it. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The closing and down payment, that's where the loan amount essentially is going to be. And then we're going to usually check a box for D. Contract would be if there's seller pay, uh, carriage financing. We rarely, rarely do this. I've never done it, actually. Mm -hmm. So D is always a box I check. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, all fixtures and essential related equipment, remote control, smart home features, and all keys related to the property, including mailbox outbuildings, et cetera, are to be left to the property. Fixtures shall include, but not limited to... Built-in appliances, attached floor coverings, drapery rods and curtain rods, window and door screens, storm doors and windows, system fixtures, irrigation, plumbing, ventilation, cooling, heating, water heaters, attached electrical lights and bathroom fixtures, light bulbs, fluorescent lamps, window blinds, awnings, fences, all planted shrubs, plants and trees, except, so this is where you would exclude things that would be considered a, a fixture. So if there's like a lamp, like a, um, uh, chandelier, that's a big one. Chandelier is so often excluded. Down below is where we're going to list personal property that will be added as part of the sale, like a refrigerator, a washer and dryer, um, all window coverings is a good one to put in here. So, um, freestanding range. Freestanding range is a good one to go in there. Uh, we did a big presentation on what a fixture was and wasn't. And if you start thinking about the definitions of it, you'll go mad. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, absolutely mad. We did a big presentation on it. And I, there's things that I just flat out couldn't tell you if it was a fixture or not. If you don't, if you're unsure if it's a fixture, but your client wants it. Put, put it, it in there. Put it in. It's not going to hurt, right? And if you're, representing a, if you're representing a seller, you're not sure if it's a fixture or not, and your client wants it, then make sure that you're going to exclude it and use some of the wording in here to exclude it. I remember you said something about, if, you know, you want the fridge that comes... And then whenever they move out, they just have an older fridge in there. You know, they swap. People have done that. So I would usually, as seen on the property on this yeah. day, that's what I was sure. so this even though that's actually out. in the contract, it is in the contract, but still okay. write it out. Yeah. Each, okay. that, that way you can be clear about it. Well, if you wanted to put like a model number in, <laughs> as seen, you know, you yeah. do that. Well, that's a lot of detail that most people don't get to, but I'd applaud you if you did. <laughs> okay. So this is where the really, 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 really important stuff starts. So buyer represents buyer has liquid and available funds for the earnest money deposit and down payment. And if an all cash transaction, the full purchase price <clears throat> sufficient to close this transaction subject herein, and it's not relying upon any contingent source of funds except for the following. So like if they're being loaned money by like a family member or getting a gift or something by a family member to, to purchase the property, it needs to be listed here because I've seen we actually had one, the Clark Group actually had one. They were representing a seller this year and the dad was going to give them the down payment and then the day of closing decided not to. Mm. But they didn't, the, the buyer's agent didn't put it in here. Uh -huh. So they forfeited their earnest money. $20,000 yeah, gone, Ooh. right? Right, if it's in the stock market. Yep. And the stock market takes, takes a plunge. And they lose all If you didn't list it as an investment account up here, then you're fine to lose all their earnest money. So if, I always have this discussion with my clients, where's your money at? Is yeah. it liquid? So since it's a checking or savings account, it's probably maybe a money market account. Those are liquid. Anything else should be disclosed right here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Wait, I'm, I'm a little bit confused. So if, it, if they lose the money, you know, the debt is the debt, the money goes down, whatever. They probably can't get a loan. And that's in there, though, that they'll give the earnest money back. Right. If you disclose mm -hmm. that that money is yeah, not you know, liquid. $50,000 gift from parents. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay. Even after removing all contingencies, yeah, they will get the money back. Well, we never per this agreement, we don't actually ever remove all our contingencies. No, oh. they there's they're, they're in section five point one below. Those will last until closing, yeah. unless oh. otherwise altered. Which, which so is Oregon's, finance. Oregon's right? really buyer friendly. Okay. Really, really buyer friendly. This document is so buyer friendly. It's ridiculous. Um, 
Okay. This is an all transaction, cash transaction buyer to provide verification of readily available funds as follows. Select one. Buyers attach a copy of verification with submission of the agreement to seller, or buyer will provide seller with the verification within blank business days or other. So let's say your client's going to purchase a property with cash from the sale of another property. So mm -hmm. one, you need to disclose the sale of another property there because they're probably using the down payment for some of it here. And then um, you'll How put do you something prefer in here. to write it for them? Everybody does it a little different. I will just say um, I always close buyer's down payment way. to come from the proceeds of the sale of their a buyer's property in the lowercase the B located at. Yeah. Um, and this word gets kind of interesting. So seller may notify, this is, I don't like the way this is written. Seller may notify buyer in writing of seller's unconditional disapproval, disapproval of the verification within blank business days. So it'd be two if not filled in. Following its receipt by seller, provided, however, such disapproval must be objectively reasonable. Okay, so this is where I have a problem. So they're going to unconditionally disapprove of it right here, but it also has to be objectively reasonable. Those are two conflicting terms in the agreement, right? So what is objectively reasonable, and then how can they unconditionally disapprove of it? Like it's this is a term in throughout this agreement that means I don't have to tell you why. I just don't like it. Go away. But it also has to be objectively reasonable. So. So this, is for any financing this is just for cash. a cash deal, oh, okay. all cash. Yep. It's all verification cash. of their funds. So, so how I would approach this and how I, if I'm representing a buyer and they have all cash is I want to have the verification to be submitted along with the offer. Yep. And then I'm going to put a big zero right here because, because look, if you accepted the offer, here's, we gave it to you. You don't get a chance to come back to me two days later because you, Got a better because offer. you unconditionally disapproved and, you, and your objective reasons because you got another offer that's better, right? Like yeah. so, so put that I'd like to make, make that a zero if you have the the if it's this one. Yep. What if, if have, it's this one? That uh, is. And then I put zero as well. The close of the home. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so on this one, you could provide if it's the close of another property, you could provide um, the, the mortgage sales. payoff yeah. showing that they owe this much and they have this much left to do it, to to give their down payment or to give to their to the closing. So let's say they have like a two million dollar house. And they only owe two hundred thousand dollars on it. And they're buying a million house is only a million five. If you show them that the equity in the house is a million eight, so you'll show the purchase agreement and the payoff. That would be your verification of funds, mm -hmm. and um, and then I would make that zero there in that case. But if it was something else, if it was just if it was a document I was getting later, then I would make that one day. I'd make it really short and get it over to them ASAP. Yep. Yep. Okay, you can't do a one day from receiving. So if they're getting it in four days and you would do one day to review it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Got it? Yep. <clears throat> okay. So that's when it's a cash transaction. If it's not a cash transaction, then we're going to be over here and we're going to disclose in section B here what kind of loan the buyer is getting. If it's conventional loan, FHA, VA, typically the seller, especially in this market, will not agree to pay buyers. Uh, not allowable VA fees. So if it's a competitive market, check that. If it's less competitive, check this. It doesn't make a huge difference either way. If it's like a, if they're getting like a jumbo loan or a hard money loan, then you're going to put other there and you say jumbo financing or, uh, or like hard money, something like that. Pre-approval letter. So buyer has attached a copy of the pre-approval letter from buyer's lender. And, and so you'll check that box. Hopefully you'll be prepared. Especially in this market, you do not want to be presenting an offer without a pre-approval letter. Even as the market slowed just a little bit, you could have be you could be competing against another offer. And if you don't have a pre-approval letter, your offer is not going to be um, taken seriously. And then buyer does not have a pre-approval letter um, at the time of making this offer, but buyer agrees to provide it, provide it as a as it turns here. So remember this section here. We're not going to get to it today, but remember this section here because we're going to use this later. Okay, this is a big one. This is one of the most important terms in this agreement. If buyer is financing any portion of the purchase price, then this transaction is subject to the following financial contingencies. One, buyer and the property to qualify for the loan from lender. So buyer qualifying is pretty, pretty obvious, but what would be the property qualifying? What would, what, basically, what would the property not qualify? What, can you give an example of what a property would not qualify? It was like an FHA loan or a VA loan and the appraiser came out and they saw something they didn't like on the property, like 
they saw cracked paint outside or water in the crawl space, or they saw the roof and they're like, eh, that roof is not going to survive five years. We're going to, the property is not going to qualify for it. So the, 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 the appraiser would add some subject, some, some conditions to the appraisal. And those would have to be met for the property to qualify for financing. So that's why that's there. Okay. Two, lender's appraisal shall not be less than the purchase price. And three, like if, you, if it was contingent upon the sale of a property or something like that, you put it here. If it was contingent upon like someone's finalizing in their divorce, you put that here. Um, anything else that would be financing, a financial contingency should be listed in right here. Um, there was one spot, I think I cruised on the Okay, up here, uh, line 72, sorry guys. If, if you're doing an FHA or a VA loan, yeah. then you're going to have to provide this addendum here. This is brand new to the agreement. This is, just came in about three months ago. So there's an FHA and a federal VA and mandatory clause. I think one's called an escape clause, the other one's called a mandatory clause. Um, what was happening was that offers were getting submitted, FHA and VA offers, where they would waive the appraisal or they would say the appraised value, you know, they could use an appraisal gap where they're going to make up 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars difference between the appraised value and the purchase price. But the problem is this is a document that always comes along because it's FHA or VA. They won't close a loan without it being signed. So you would enter into the agreement thinking that you were going to have this appraisal clause, but then in order for the loan to close, you actually have to have this one signed. And it kind of defunct, it kind of negated the agreement that you made you and made, made down here in 5.1 as, as it pertains to the appraisal. And so now they're saying you have to do it front. And so people don't like it because they don't like having to face this. Uh, early on in the transaction, but me, I love it because it's just very upfront. It's very, it's, it's like, it gives out, the, it gives it, it gives it, because the seller is not probably going to know that the VA or FHA are going to require this addendum that says that the buyer can walk away if the appraisal doesn't come in at value. <clears throat> the buyer, sits, the, the seller is not going to know that. So they're going to agree to this offer thinking everything's hunky dory, and then they're going to be forced to sign this addendum three weeks later that negates what the main term, like one of the critical terms of the agreement are. So now we're presenting it up front and I like it. So it should be. Um, 5.2 is too big. So let's, <laughs> so- Do you wanna stop so, there? Yeah, let's stop here. So let's just go over this one last time. I just wanna read this because I want it to set in. If buyer is financing any purchase, any portion of the purchase price. So if we're not using the cash option, then this applies. Then this transaction is subject to the following financing contingencies. Buyer of the property to qualify for the loan from lender and lender's appraisal shall not be less than the purchase price. And then what other ones we write in here. 5.2 deals with the failure of these, of these conditions. And we will address that um, next week. We're not next week. Yeah, um, next week at noon is code of ethics here in this room. So, um, Kelly's class is not happening. Is the code of ethics only an hour? Yeah, it's like three hours. hours. So, oh, wow. um, so we're gonna have to move group coaching too. Code of ethics is required. Code is a required. The real code of ethics. It's required to take this class. We have not taken it. If Austin, you're a new are you on there? Or if you haven't taken it in the last three years, you must take it. They have it online. There is a PMR option you can take online. We are hosting one, so. No, nope, Austin's yeah, and I have to take it. I, mm. I need to take it. So, um, so that's, yeah, that's one of those things. I'm here. Really I just want to show that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what I want you to do is that's on the Google calendar. It needs oh, to. It's only on there for an hour. Is it? It's only on there for an hour, but it's a free hour class. Yeah. So, yeah. can you change that on the Google calendar? Yeah. So, group coaching next week. Hmm. I'll get back to you. <laughs> See you if we'll move so we'll start at 5.2 in two weeks. Okay. And then Austin, we're going to, you can stop recording. Um, but everybody's on here in, in here for the group coaching. So is it okay if I